Seen it once, don't remember when. Think it's time to watch it again. Follow, subscribe, stay up to date. Episodes drop the last Friday. It's a man, it's a man, forgot that. It's a man, it's a man, forgot that. It's a man, it's a man, forgot that. And welcome to an all-new season of the Matt Forgot That podcast, the place to recollect and reminisce. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to rewatch and review a movie or TV pilot that I've seen before but don't quite remember. It could be a blockbuster, critic's choice, or cult classic. To join the conversation, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've reviewed or want to share your own trip down memory lane, use the hashtag MattForgotThat on social. Before we start, I wanted to talk about some of the changes that are happening to this podcast this season. If you missed it in the theme song or you fast forwarded through it, which why would you? I've decided to release this podcast on the last Friday of the month to cling on to the Flashback Friday trend. I mean, this is a nostalgic podcast. Since I moved the Matt Watch That podcast to bi-weekly, there were times that both podcasts would release an episode on the same day, so I wanted to avoid that going forward. Also, I've decided to add a recommendation, or a recommendation, to this podcast. I've really enjoyed looking back on the commercials and toys and television series and movies that were around during my childhood that I wanted to feature more of that in the podcast. So I hope you enjoy these changes as we travel back in time to recollect and reminisce. On to the main attraction. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is skip it. Two stars watch at your own risk. Three stars standard fare. Four stars worth checking out and five stars must see. Now, if I give a title five stars, it doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca, Jaws, or Seinfeld. I rank titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. So let's jump into it. In this episode of the podcast, I'm re-watching and reviewing True Lies from 1994. In case anyone is wondering, I started off last season with Total Recall, another Schwarzenegger movie. It's not my intention to start off each season with one of his films. It just happened to work that way. I was in the mood for an action movie. This one rose to the top. It was directed by King of the World, James Cameron, who helmed The Terminator, Aliens, The Abyss, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, Titanic, and The Smurfs. I mean Avatar. The screenplay was written by the director, based on the French spy comedy La Totale, by Claude Zidi, Simon Michel, and Didier Kaminica. It stars Arnold Schwarzenegger as Henry Tasker. What hasn't this man done? He was born in Austria, started weightlifting in his teens. At the age of 20, he won the Mr. Universe title, and would go on to win Mr. Olympia not once, but seven times. He made people interested in bodybuilding contests, and was featured in the 1975 documentary Pumping Iron. Despite sounding like Dracula, he was cast in Hercules in New York, though his voice was dubbed. His breakthrough role would be in Conan the Barbarian in 1982, and its sequel, Conan the Destroyer, but it would be the Terminator that skyrocketed him to stardom. He became the go-to action star of the 80s with Commando, Raw Deal, Predator, The Running Man, and Red Heat. He would expand his genres, appearing in comedies, Twins, Kindergarten Cop and Junior, and the family film Jingle All the Way. Alongside contemporaries and competitors Sylvester Stallone and Bruce Willis, they invested in the theme restaurant Planet Hollywood. He took a break from filmmaking to become the governor of California from 2003 to 2011. Jamie Lee Curtis portrays his wife, Helen. She was born to Hollywood royalty, Tony Curtis from Some Like It Hot, and Janet Lee of Psycho fame. She made her film debut in the John Carpenter film Halloween and would return in seven of its sequels. Her next roles were in the horror genre with The Fog, Prom Night, Terror Train, and Road Games, solidifying her status as a scream queen. The 1983 film, Trading Places, helped shed her horror roots, and she would go on to be cast in Perfect, A Fish Called Wanda, Blue Steel, My Girl, Forever Young, House Arrest, and Freaky Friday. 
She just earned an Academy Award nomination for Best Performance by an Actress in a Supporting Role for Everything Everywhere All at Once. Upon marrying Christopher Guest, she became the Lady Hayden Guest of Sailing in the County of Essex. She's a best-selling author and was nominated for a Grammy in the Best Spoken Album for Children. She's the godmother to Jake and Maggie Gyllenhaal, and she has a U.S. patent for a biodegradable diaper. This is what I remember. Tom Arnold. Now, I grew up watching Roseanne, and he made a couple appearances on that show. Very jittery, very hyper, and I was familiar with the rumors going around that he and Roseanne were difficult on set and yada yada yada, so I might have had a preconceived notion of who he is, but this movie certainly changed it. He was really funny, a perfect foil for Arnold Schwarzenegger. Then you have Jamie Lee Curtis. Obviously, the most famous scene from this movie is the strip tease. Also, one of the funniest moments caught on film, which was a suggestion from the director, and Jamie Lee pulled it off perfectly. Now I'm heading off to watch the movie. This is what I forgot. Tia Carrere. How could I forget her? She's featured prominently, one of the main villains, but I had no recollection of her in the movie. And I feel so bad about that, because when I met her briefly, she seemed like one of the most down-to-earth genuine people, and I vowed on that day to work with her in the future. And Bill Paxton. He's a highlight of the film, playing a car salesman trying to con his way into having an affair with Helen. Very funny in this role. The movie starts at the estate of billionaire Jamal Khaled in Lake Chapeau, Switzerland. He's throwing an invite-only party which gets infiltrated by secret agent Henry Tasker through an underwater entry where he breaks through a thin layer of ice. He covertly sneaks into the house with the assistance of his partners, Albert Gibson and Faisal, who are stationed in a nearby van. Henry mingles with the crowd of elites before heading upstairs through the library and onto the balcony, where he climbs to the office of Khaled. He installs a device into the computer, and Faisal attempts to encrypt the files, which will take a few minutes. In the meantime, Henry makes his way back to the party, where he catches the eye of Juno Skinner, an attractive art dealer. After a scintillating conversation about paintings and sculptures, they dance the tango. Apparently, this is the go-to move for action comedies. Eh, we need to kill two minutes. Let's throw in a tango. There was one in Mr. and Mrs. Smith between Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and most recently in Red Notice, with Gal Gadot and The Rock. I mean, they're always fun, but it's not exactly original anymore. So a security guard comes across the broken ice, and alerts of a breach, as Faisal unlocks the encryption and downloads the files. Albert advises Henry that he needs to leave the premises, but he's stopped by a guard looking for his invitation. Henry sets off an explosion allowing him to escape, but not before taking out a few pursuers in an exciting chase. A few hours later, Henry returns home to his wife, Helen Tasker, and teenage daughter, Dana, or Dana. They believe he works as a sales rep and was away at a convention, completely unaware of his status as a secret agent with the counterterrorism force called Omega Sector. The files downloaded uncover that the finances of Jamal Khaled included $100 million in wire transfers from the Commerce Bank International, which is a well-known front for certain countries to bankroll terrorist activities. And a week ago, former warheads were smuggled out of the former Soviet Republic of Kazakhstan. Henry Albert and Faisal believe Khaled's group bought the nukes and is trying to bring them over to U.S. soil. Their boss, Spencer Trilby, is unimpressed with their findings, and directs the team to uncover solid evidence before there's a terrorist attack. Here's a quote without context. Yeah, I remember the first time I got shot out of a cannon. True Lies is a masterclass of action movies. Granted, it's totally cartoon violence. Over the top, guns a blazin'. I'd put it between Terminator 2 and Total Recall. There was good rapport between Schwarzenegger and Tom Arnold. Jamie Lee Curtis starts out as an old-school prototypical housewife, a little nebbish, understated. She's in a loving marriage but feels a bit unfulfilled, but by the end she comes into her own, very convincing in her character arc. She's funny, vulnerable, plays all the emotions really well. The movie does lose a little steam with the family subplot, though. Normally you try and interweave the A storyline with the B storyline, but once it focuses on the family, it kinda gets off track a little, even though it all comes together at the end. 
But ultimately, this movie is all about the stunts. And there were some great action sequences. From a bathroom shootout, to a chase on horseback, helicopters, cars, motorcycles. It seemed like whatever popped into James Cameron's head was in this movie. Now for a little trivial trivia. This was the first movie to have a production budget of over $100 million. It would be exceeded the next year by Waterworld. The cinematography was captured by Russell Carpenter, whose filmography includes The Lawnmower Man, Hard Target, Charlie's Angels, 21, Jobs, Ant-Man, and won an Academy Award for Best Cinematography of Titanic in 1998. It was co-edited by Conrad Buff and Richard A. Harris, who were nominated for Best Film Editing for Terminator 2 Judgment Day and won for Titanic. The score was composed by Brad Fidel, who wrote the music for The Terminator, and its sequel, The Serpent and the Rainbow, The Accused, and Johnny Mnemonic. The soundtrack featured songs by the Bee Gees, Living Color, Sade, and Screaming Trees. The runtime is 2 hours 21 minutes. It had a budget of $110 million and grossed $379 million at the box office. It was nominated for a Best Effects Visual Effects Oscar at the 1995 Academy Awards. Jamie Lee Curtis won a Golden Globe for Best Actress, Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy. I give it 4 out of 5 stars. Take off a star if alpha males make you feel uncomfortable. This is not your movie. If you've seen True Lies and have opinions on the movie, let me know what you think using the hashtag Matt Forgot That. <laughs> Moving right along... Each episode, I'm going to post clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, commercials, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there'll be a playlist called Matt Forgot That Playback. Pop-up video. Pop-up video was a program on VH1 that featured music videos with pop-up bubbles that provided snarky commentary and information on the artist, the song, or random facts related to the images or storyline in the video. Each episode would feature four to five music videos and sometimes include a theme around one artist, the Rolling Stones, years, 1984, genres, all disco, or holidays like Halloween or Christmas. At the time, ratings for watching music videos had diminished and networks were trying their best to create ways to keep the audience engaged. Countdown show Total Request Live resorted to only showing clips. Beavis and Butthead on Sister Network MTV gave their humorous takes on hard rock and hair metal videos. This was vh one slant. Created by Woody Thompson and Tad Lowe, it was initially rejected by television executives, thinking that their viewers didn't want to read TV. But after making a pilot episode with You Learn by Alanis Morissette and TLC's Waterfalls, it was immediately greenlit. It was often funny and irreverent, and always entertaining. As its popularity grew, it spawned a short-lived quiz show, Pop-Up Quiz, and a board game, Pop-Up Video Trivia Game. It became one of the highest-rated programs on VH1. It aired for eight seasons, 209 episodes, from 1996 to 2002, and 2011 to 2012. I've selected a couple of videos which show off the concept, Physical by Olivia Newton-John, and Hello by Lionel Richie. They're all available in the Matt Forgot That playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, that's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a nostalgic movie or TV series that you might have forgotten. Today I'm talking about Thunder in Paradise. Created by Michael Burke, Gregory J. Bonin, and Douglas Schwartz, who were also responsible for the Sands and Sun series, Baywatch. It tells the story of former Navy SEALs, Randolph J. Hurricane Spencer, and Martin Brew Baker, and their high-tech, futuristic boat named Thunder, who get hired for various freelance mercenary jobs. The series stars Hulk Hogan, former wrestler, Chris Lemon, son of Jack, and Carol Alt, popular model. So how did a mess of a show like this come to be? In 1993, Vince McMahon, owner of the World Wrestling Federation, WWF, or now known as WWE, and Hulk Hogan, its top star for a decade, couldn't come to terms on a new contract. There was also negative publicity on the company due to an ongoing steroid investigation and eventual trial where Hogan and others testified about their use of the substance, which tarnished the reputation of the Say Your Prayers, Eat Your Vitamins hero. 
Hulk Hogan decided to leave the company and focus his efforts on acting, despite not being able to. I mean, have you seen the disasters No Holds Barred, Suburban Commando, and Mr. Nanny? Creator and producer Douglas Schwartz reached out to Hogan, and they filmed a direct-to-video feature, which served as a pilot. It was originally slated to be on CBS, but when they backed out, it was sold and aired in first-run syndication. The show was filmed at Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa and Disney MGM Studios, which was the same space that WWF rival World Championship Wrestling shot WCW Saturday Night. Thunder in Paradise was a modest success, there were plans for a second season, but Eric Bischoff, the executive producer and senior vice president of WCW, offered Hulk Hogan a lucrative contract to return to the squared circle. The ending theme song was written by Hulk Hogan and songwriting partners Jimmy Hart and John McGuire, who co-wrote many theme songs for wrestlers including Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Ted DiBiase, and The Legion of Doom. It's actually much catchier and more memorable than the opening theme song. Hulk Hogan contributed as bassist on the track. Yes, the Hulkster started his career in entertainment playing bass guitar for local bands. Now, he's known for his exaggerations, and one of his most famous ones is that when Jason Newstead left Metallica, he was up for the open position. Really? Now, I was never a big Hulk Hogan fan, although I will admit, when Earthquake attacked him on the Brother Love Show and cracked his ribs, I wrote wishing Hogan a speedy recovery and got back a postcard with one of those silk screen fake signatures on it. But to me, I always liked the Intercontinental guys. Macho Man Randy Savage, Bret the Hitman Hart, Tito Santana. They had more exciting matches to make. And if you're a fan of wrestling, you'll spot cameo appearances by Mouth of the South Jimmy Hart, The Icon Sting, Brutus the Barber Beefcake, Jim the Anvil Nightheart, Giant Gonzalez, and Typhoon, aka the Shockmaster. And if you don't know the story behind that, you should pause this episode and look it up immediately. Thunder in Paradise was on for one season, 22 episodes in 1994. That's all for this edition of Matt Forgot That. Thanks for listening to me reminisce. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've reviewed, or want to share your own trip down memory lane, use the hashtag MattForgotThat on social. Head over to MattSarosky.com for the latest news and updates, and come back next time for the rewatch and review. She made her film debut. Debut? The movie starts at the estate of billionaire Jamal Khaled in Lake Chepo, Switzerland. I guess we have to look that up. Hulk Hogan decided to leave the company and focus his efforts on acting, despite not being able to. <laughs> oh, I made myself laugh.